welcome to my reading of The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County by Mark Twain. This classic short story, first published in 1865, is one of Twain's most famous humorous works. Set in the Gold Rush era West, it tells the tale of a competitive frog jumping contest centered around a local character named Smiley, who loves to bet on just about anything. With its clever use of dialect, dry wit, and unexpected twist, this story exemplifies Twain's talent for capturing the spirit of American life and humor. So sit back and enjoy this amusing tale. In compliance with the request of a friend of mine who wrote me from the East, I called on good-natured, garrulous old Simon Wheeler and inquired after my friend's friend, Leonidas W. Smiley, as requested to do, and I hereunto append the result. I have a lurking suspicion that Leonidas W. Smiley is a myth, that my friend never knew such a personage, and that he only conjectured that if I asked Old Wheeler about him, it would remind him of his infamous Jim Smiley, and he would go to work and bore me nearly to death with some infernal reminiscence of him as long and tedious as it should be useless to me. If that was the design, it certainly succeeded. I found Simon Wheeler dozing comfortably by the barroom stove of the old dilapidated tavern in the ancient mining camp of Angels, and I noticed that he was fat and bald-headed and had an expression of winning gentleness and simplicity upon his tranquil countenance. He roused up and gave me good day. I told him a friend of mine had commissioned me to make some inquiries about a cherished companion of his boyhood named Leonidas W. Smiley, Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, a young minister of the gospel, who he had heard was at one time a resident of Angel's Camp. I added that if Mr. Wheeler could tell me anything about this Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, I would feel under many obligations to him. Simon Wheeler backed me into a corner and blockaded me there with his chair, and then sat me down and reeled off the monotonous narrative which follows this paragraph. He never smiled, he never frowned, he never changed his voice from the gentle flowing key to which he tuned the initial sentence. He never betrayed the slightest suspicion of enthusiasm. But all through the interminable narrative, there ran a vein of impressive earnestness and sincerity which showed me plainly that, so far from his imagining that there was anything ridiculous or funny about his story, he regarded it as a really important matter and admired its two heroes as men of transcendent genius and finesse. To me, the spectacle of a man drifting serenely along through such a queer yarn without ever smiling was exquisitely absurd. As I said before, I asked him to tell me what he knew of Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, and he replied as follows. I let him go on in his own way and never interrupted him once. There was a fellow here once by the name of Jim Smiley, in the winter of 49, or maybe it was the spring of 50. I don't recollect exactly somehow, though what makes me think it was one or the other is because I remember the big flume wasn't finished when he first came to the camp. But anyway, he was the curiousest man about always betting on anything that turned up you ever see. If he could get anybody to bet on the other side, and if he couldn't, he'd change sides. Any way that suited the other man would suit him anyway, just so as he got a bet, he was satisfied. But still, he was lucky, uncommon lucky. He most always come out winner. He was always ready and laying for a chance. There couldn't be no solitary thing mentioned, but that fella'd offer to bet on it, and take any side you please, as I was just telling you. If there was a horse race, you'd find him flush, or you'd find him busted at the end of it. If there was a dog fight, he'd bet on it. If there was a cat fight, he'd bet on it. If there was a chicken fight, he'd bet on it. Why? If there was two birds setting on a fence, he would bet you which one would fly first. Or if there was a camp meeting, he would be there regular to bet on Parson Walker, which he judged to be the best exhorter about here. And so he was too, and a good man. If he even seen a straddlebug start to go anywheres, he would bet you how long it would take him to get wherever he was going to. And if you took him up, 
he would follow that straddlebug to Mexico, but what he would find out where he was bound for and how long he was on the road. Lots of the boys here have seen that smiley and can tell you about him. Why, it never made no difference to him he would bet on anything, the dangdest fella. Parson Walker's wife laid very sick once for a good while, and it seemed as if they weren't going to save her. But one morning he come in, and Smiley asked how she was, and he said she was considerable better, thank the Lord for his infinite mercy, and coming on so smart that with the blessing of Providence, she'd get well yet. And Smiley, before he thought, says, well, I'll risk two and a half that she don't anyway. This year Smiley had a mare the boys called her the 15-minute nag, but that was only in fun, you know, because of course she was faster than that and he used to win money on that horse. For all she was so slow and always had the asthma or the distemper or the consumption or something of that kind. They used to give her two or three hundred yards start and then pass her underway. But always at the fag end of the race she'd get excited and desperate like and come cavorting and straddling up and scattering her legs around limber, sometimes in the air and sometimes out to one side amongst the fences and kicking up more dust and raising more racket with her coughing and sneezing and blowing her nose and always fetch up at the stand just about a neck ahead, as near as you could cipher it down. And he had a little small bull pup that to look at him you'd think he wands worth a cent but to set around and look ornery and lay for a chance to steal something. But as soon as money was up on him, he was a different dog. His underjawed begin to stick out like the faux castle of a steamboat and his teeth would uncover and shine savage like the furnaces. And a dog might tackle him and bully, rag him and bite him and throw him over his shoulder two or three times. And Andrew Jackson, which was the name of the pup, Andrew Jackson would never let on but what he was satisfied and hadn't expected nothing else, and the bets being doubled and doubled on the other side all the time, till the money was all up. And then all of a sudden, he would grab that other dog just by the giant of his hind leg and freeze on it. Not chew, you understand, but only just grip and hang on till they thronged up the sponge, if it was a year. Smiley always come out winner on that pup till he harnessed a dog once that didn't have no hind legs because they'd been sawed off by a circular saw and when the thing had gone along far enough and the money was all up and he come to make a snatch for his pet bolt he saw in a minute how he'd been imposed on and how the other dog had him in the door so to speak and he peered sure prized and then he looked sorta of discouraged, like and didn't try no more to win the fight. And so he got shucked out bad. He gives Smiley a look, as much as to say his heart was broke, and it was his fault for putting up a dog that hadn't no hind legs for him to take bolt of, which was his main dependence in a fight, and then he limped off a piece and laid down and died. It was a good pup, was that Andrew Jackson, and would have made a name for himself if he'd lived, for the stuff was in him, and he had genius, I know it, because he hadn't had no opportunities to speak of, and it don't stand to reason that a dog could make such a fight as he could under them circumstances if he hadn't no talent. It always makes me feel sorry when I think of that last fight of his'n and the way it turned out. Well, this year Smiley had rat terriers and chicken cocks and tomcats and all of them kind of things till you couldn't rest and you couldn't fetch nothing for him to bet on, but he'd match you. He catched a frog one day and took him home and said he calculated to edicate him. And so he never done nothing for three months but set in his backyard and learn that frog to jump. And you bet you he did learn him too. He'd give him a little punch behind and the next minute you'd see that frog whirling in the air like a donut, see him turn one somerset, or maybe a couple if he got a good start, and come down flat-footed and all right like a cat. He got him up so in the matter of catching flies and kept him in practice so constant that he'd nail a fly every time as far as he could see him. 
Smiley said, all a frog wanted was education and he could do most anything and I believe him. Why, I've seen him set Dan Webster down here on this floor. Dan Webster was the name of the frog and sing out, flies, Dan'll flies, and quicker than you could wink, he'd spring straight up and snake a fly off in the counter there and flop down on the floor again as solid as a gob of mud and fall to scratching the side of his head with his hind foot, as indifferent as if he hadn't no idea he'd been doing any more than any frog might do. You never see a frog so modest and straightforward as he was, for all he was so gifted. And when it come to fair and square, jumping on a dead level, he could get over more ground at one straddle than any animal of his breed you ever see. Jumping on a dead level was his strong suit, you understand? And when it come to that, Smiley would ante up money on him as long as he had a red. Smiley was monstrous proud of his frog, and well he might be, for fellas that had travelled and been everywheres, all said he laid over any frog that ever they see. Well, Smiley kept the beast in a little lattice box, and he used to fetch him downtown sometimes and lay for a bet. One day, a feller a stranger in the camp, he was come across him with his box and says, What might it be that you've got in the box? And Smiley says, sorta indifferent like, It might be a parrot, or it might be a canary, maybe. But it ain't it's only just a frog. And the fella took it and looked at it careful and turned it round this way and that and says, I'm Sotis. Well, what's he good for? Well, Smiley says, easy and careless, he's good enough for one thing, I should judge he can outjump any frog in Calaveras County. The fella took the box again and took another long, particular look and give it back to Smiley and says, very deliberate, well, I don't see no peance about that frog that's any better than any other frog. Maybe you don't, Smiley says. Maybe you understand frogs and maybe you don't understand them. Maybe you've had experience and maybe you ain't only a amateur, as it were. Anyways, I've got my opinion and I'll risk $40 that he can outjump any frog in Calaveras County. And the fella studied a minute and then says, kinda sad, like, well, I'm only a stranger here and I ain't got no frog, but if I had a frog, I'd bet you. And then Smiley says, that's all right, that's all right. If you'll hold my box a minute, I'll go and get you a frog. And so the fella took the box and put up his $40 along with Smiley's and sat down to wait. So he sat there a good while thinking and thinking to himself, and then he got the frog out and prized his mouth open and took a teaspoon and filled him full of quail shot, filled him pretty near up to his chin and set him on the floor. Smiley, he went to the swamp and slopped around in the mud for a long time. And finally, he catched a frog and fetched him in and give him to this fella and says, now if you're ready, set him alongside of Dan'l with his four paws just even with Dan'l and I'll give the word. Then he says, one, two, three, jump. And him and the fella touched up the frogs from behind and the new frog hopped off. But Dan'll give a heave and heisted up his shoulders so like a Frenchman, but it was no use he couldn't budge. He was planted as solid as an anvil and he couldn't no more stir than if he was anchored out. Smiley was a good deal surprised and he was disgusted too. But he didn't have no idea what the matter was, of course. The fella took the money and started away. And when he was going out at the door, he sorta of jerked his thumb over his shoulders this way at Dan'l and says again, very deliberate, well, I don't see no pints about that frog that's any better than any other frog. Smiley, he stood scratching his head and looking down at Dan'l a long time. And at last he says, I do wonder what in the nation that frog throwed off for. I wonder if there ain't something the matter with him, he bears to look mighty baggy somehow. And he catched Dan'l by the nap of the neck and lifted him up and says, why blame my cats if he don't weigh five pound? And turned him upside down and he belched out a double handful of shot. 
and then he see how it was, and he was the maddest man he set the frog down and took out after that fella. But he never catched him. And here Simon Wheeler heard his name called from the front yard and got up to see what was wanted. And turning to me as he moved away, he said, Just sit where you are, stranger, and rest easy. I ain't going to be gone a second. But by your leave, I did not think that a continuation of the history of the enterprising vagabond, Jim Smiley, would be likely to afford me much information concerning the Reverend Leonidas W.W. W. Smiley, and so I started away. At the door, I met the sociable Wheeler returning, and he button-holed me and recommenced. Well, this year Smiley had a yellow one-eyed cow that didn't have no tail, only just a short stump like a banana and... Oh, hang Smiley and his afflicted cow, I muttered good-naturedly, and bidding the old gentleman good day, I departed. Thank you for listening to my reading of The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County by Mark Twain. I hope you enjoyed this humorous tale of trickery, wit, and good old-fashioned storytelling. Twain's ability to capture the eccentricities of American life with such a light-hearted touch has made this story a timeless favorite. If you enjoyed this reading, feel free to share your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more readings. Thanks again for joining me, and I look forward to sharing more great stories with you soon.